Welcome back to another evening of Sky Chower. I'm Noah. And I'm Jesse. All right, this is uh, episode 84. And this evening, what we have for you here is the... Uh, was it Benella? Benellin? Benellin? Balnellin. Benellin. Balnellin. 12 you year. Got your balls nellin. <laughs> <laughs> 12 year from Glen Livet, right? Uh, Space Side Glen Livet. Okay, awesome. And then we got our get togethers and uh, shout outs, as, as well as our uh, restaurant review of the JD Bait Shop. Not sure what you're really trying to bait there. I'm not, I'm not quite sure what's opposite of a cougar, but. <laughs> Goldfish, I don't know. <laughs> And then we have uh, our Smart Challenge, the best of Heath Ledger. Scotch review. Bayside Glen Livet, uh, Balnellan single malt scotch whiskey. One thing to note, and they do this very well, the different brands and uh, advertisers, is that the Speyside Glen Livet, Glen Livet, is an area within Speyside. There is actually a, a Glen Livet distillery. It does not state whether or not this comes from that distillery. Highly likely it does. But even if it doesn't, it's still from the Glenlivet area in Speyside, in the Highlands, in Scotland. So, so we're getting like into like you know like the subtoir there, right? We got yeah. like Glenlivet, then we got Speyside, and then as we get larger and larger, you go up and up and up, and that. Then we got Highlands, and then we got Scotland. Yeah, and then we got World. Yeah. Well, what, what's about to be left of the world after <laughs> Biden does whatever he does next? So. I'm not sure if you had any other or better luck than I did, but uh, I didn't really find a whole lot on this particular scotch. Uh, one of the few things I found about this particular scotch is that they do pride themselves, like many uh, scotches or distilleries typically, but scotches do, and that is their source of water. And here they source their water from the Balnellan Spring there in Speyside, in Highlands, in Scotland. And Glen Yeah. <laughs> 40% ABV, um, not a whole lot of reviews to your point. So whether it's a relatively new, um, it's a great blue. Like it's what caught my eyes. The price point was right around right the $40 mark. I uh, can't complain too much about that. I do like the, I, I, I agree. I think the that dark colored blue there on that tan is, uh, is really nice. It's pretty sharp. Uh, I'm kind of wondering what the uh, label looks like. Well, let's find out. Again, one thing we do prefer, a scotch with a tin for all of you liquor stores and whoever else are selling a scotch. Where are all the tins going? Are you recycling them? Uh, typically, I think they're still coming with it. Uh, the label's pretty nice, too. Yeah, it looks really nice and classic with the uh, that, um, was it um, kind of like a vanilla color? Or? It is a vanilla color. It's exactly what it is. Yeah, it's very, uh, makes me think of a pirate. <laughs> hey. Go get my dagger. And I, I think the uh, like kind of like that more darker tones type of that uh, kind of coloring there on the label um, really goes well with the color of the scotch. That's right. Makes for a nice presentation. I'll never forget, you know, uh, the joke that the little old lady, she smokes in front of my store every day. And then at 7 o'clock, she sees the doors open, extinguishes her cigarette. She's respectful. She doesn't do it like on the door jam. She does it like 15 feet away. Then she comes in and one day she tells me, ah, how much does a pirate charge for corn? And I'm like, oh, I don't know how much. She's like, ah, buccaneer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Great joke. She was a funny little gal. Um, and, and, you know, I don't even care that she smokes like a chimney. She's like literally there every day, though, at store opening. Is there such a thing as like a grandma joke versus like dad jokes? Dude, that was definitely a grandma <laughs> joke. Like, what are you doing with that corn? Ah, buccaneer. <laughs> All right. Is that buck in the rear? <laughs> buck in the rear. Maybe that's what she said. <laughs> Let's hope not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe the Randy Grandy was going after you. Have <laughs> buck in the rear. <laughs> We're gonna say no. 
<laughs> Staying away from Randy Granny, going to the Speyside Glenlivet area of Scotland. Yeah, it is a great label. Uh, pretty standard, nice thick foil at the top. Let's see what they did, what kind of magic they worked for us here. And it looks like a pretty cheap cork topper. So they do have some uh, real cork there, but with a plastic topper. Wah, wah, wah. I really like the ones that have like the dark wood on there. Yeah, or even just real wood. Yeah. And then to our point, hey, like I'll spend the extra buck, make it sexy, engrave that thing. Agreed. Dude, this has got to be uh, the smallest cork I've ever seen <laughs> in a bottle of full size scotch. Size matters, dude. Size totally matters. Like, I had to like get out the grippy fingers and mm, oh, take my good hand. Made me think of scary. Is the girth well type. enough there? Mm -hmm. You just like looking for size there. <laughs> ah, hey, it fit. Ew. <laughs> we need some women guests here to talk about the girth and size there of a cork. Yeah, dude, this, uh, it's <laughs> wet. Who knows? It's wet. Right. It's wet. It's got some good color through the glass. Only the tip. <laughs> yeah, that's all you get with this one. <laughs> Can you feel me now? No? Can't? Still waiting. <sighs> that's everything. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it's a tight fit. Every every millimeter of that centimeter, <laughs> half centimeter. <laughs> All right, up to our TC notes and uh, warp speed. Cheers. All right, cheers. Okay, this uh, particular uh, scotch here, and as we stated, uh, you're not sure if it's actually from, from Glenlivet's distillery, but it is from the uh, Glenlivet area in Speyside, which is also in the Highlands. And then once again, it's called the Balnellan. 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 All right, so here's kind of like what I'm picking up from Balnellan is that on the nose, I'm getting like hints of like coconut with honey and a bit of a peach um and the one thing i'm noticing all the way through from the from the time i smell it to when it hits my palate to the finish is that sherry sweetness that just kind of coats all the way through now this uh picking up of the uh of the coconut I'm not sure if maybe that's because I just had a, uh, a chai latte with uh, coconut milk. But uh, in any case, uh, um, I do get like a slight hint of that. On the palate, though, I'm getting something like uh, more like cedar with some honey and chamomile. Once again, I'm still catching that hint of the uh, sherry sweetness there. Excuse me, the, sh the sherry sweetness. And on my finish... I'm picking up a little bit more honey. It's like almost like a honey almond mm. with, uh, once again, that sweetness just still coating there. Uh, it's really good. Um, the sweetness I, I'm enjoying, it's not like overly sweet or anything like that. It's just like a nice mild sweetness that just kind of floats from the nose to the mid palate all the way to the finish and lingers. And when you get like the other hints of like the chamomile, um, the honey, the cedar, uh, and the uh, almonds, it just uh, makes for a nice, easy, quaffable uh, scotch. Uh, is this something that I could take to a, a party? I'd say yes. I think it looks it looks nice enough. Uh, it's easy to drink. 
and uh, I would definitely take it to us, you know, a, a poker night or anything like that, or hanging out with a buddy or something like that. Um, I'm not really sure if I'd smoke a cigar with this one because I'm not sure if the cigar, the smoke from the cigar, would overpower it or not. Um, and talking about like matching it up with stuff, uh, you had some uh, some of this leftover cake here. Um, I believe you said that it was like dark chocolate uh, shavings with milk chocolate frosting and a moist chocolate cake with uh, some chocolate mousse in there, right? Mm. And the sweetness of this chocolate cake, honestly, you know, with the sweetness from the scotch and the sweetness of the cake, you think it'd be like overpoweringly sweet or like super sweet, but it really wasn't. It is like it was almost like the the tannins or or whatever it is from the uh, the bitterness from the dark chocolate help mild out some of that sweetness that you get in the scotch. And so the sweetness just made it for a nice coating of sweetness um, with just like that nice. And I, I think I picked up a little bit more chamomile there on my finish when I was drinking the uh, scotch, having it with the cake and made it for a really great match. And I would highly recommend it. All right. Especially for what, $40? I think it was 39 Okay. So that's a great price point. <laughs> yeah. For me, um, a lot of similar tasting notes. And an interesting drink. I guess that's how I would put it. Not super strong in any one area. Kind of like a smooth operator. Smooth operator. All right. Color, though. Medium brass. Almost a hint of copper in there. Uh, not as dark still as the the McAllen edition number six, but another one of these great colors. This looks fun in a glass and in a nice glass. Um, for me, the nose is very interesting. I have a touch of a cold, so my, my senses may be a little bit off. I do get the peach that you're getting. And it's interesting because for me though, it's mingled and I love peach, uh, you know, uh, face off one of the best lines ever peach. I could eat a peach for hours. Are you sure that's the right kind of peach he's talking about? I, I, I mean, come on. Come on, you know, you, 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 you know what I'm talking about. White peach, Saturn peach, what do they call them? You can, eat, you, you can eat a peach for hours, right? We got mm -hmm. it. <laughs> but I'm getting a hint of blueberry in there. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't get hints of blueberry. Um, mm -hmm. And I get it just at the utmost front of the palate. So a little bit of peach, a little bit of blueberry. And then where it's interesting is that these three things go miraculously well for me on the nose and into the palate, lightly into the palate, um, in different areas of the palate. But that third and final smell, uh, the third and final scent on my nose is maple syrup. Ooh. It's literally like, that sweet, smooth peach, it's uh, its an attractive scent in the middle. It's, it really is an attractive <laughs> <what> scent. <laughs> um, right at the front. Are you talking about eating peaches? Um, right, right, but it's, it's like... Canadian peach? It, it's like two peaks in a valley. You've got this <coughs> immediate... <laughs> <laughs> are you really describing the scotch here? Are you yeah. describing something else? This is just a nose in the scotch, all right? <laughs> okay. You got to get your nose in there, Noah. <laughs> oh, okay. You got your nose in there. Okay. And immediately, the, the first peak is wild blueberries. Wild blueberries. We just had some of this with our homemade barbecue sauce. And then, as you get it in there, you got the peach. And it's that, like, sweet, white, summer peach. And then... The next little peak is literally maple syrup. You know, like the like you mix those three and it's like sticky sweet. It's a great smell. <coughs> Excuse me. And onto the palate. Again, the blueberry right, right, right at the front, followed closely by the vanilla. Also, a hint of white pepper at the front of the palate. <coughs> Oh, man, <coughs> my pepper's killing me. Um, and then creamy salted butter with a hint of a white oak finish. <coughs> um, the finish itself, medium, 
for most of the flavors in there, the thing that does linger. And it, at first I was like, okay, is that cinnamon? No, I think it is oak, the dry oak with a little bit of white pepper. I love that in my gravy, uh, maybe, you know, homemade white gravy for biscuits and gravy, a little bit of white pepper. Uh, it's got a great finish. Overall, I love the canister. I love the bottle. I hate the topper and the short ass cork, but it's not going to offend anyone. I love the fact that at least it's real cork. It's not press cork. It's not fake cork. Um, the color is amazing. Would I take it to a party? Yeah. Would I take it? You know, for that price point, I'm not much of it. I, I mean, would I use it in foods? Yes. That's my, that's what I would love to do is try this in our blueberry barbecue sauce that we make ribs with. I think this could be a great addition. Um, a fun, easy drink, not offensive on any front to the point where, man, am I taking it to a fun party where I'm not trying to impress anyone? Yeah, if I'm trying to impress a bunch of connoisseurs much like ourselves, this is probably not the scotch I'm bringing unless I'm making a point about it's from the Glenlivet area of the Seaside <laughs> region of the Highlands, uh, not far off the coast in Scotland, <laughs> which everyone already knows every scotch is, uh, but a fun drink. It is definitely a fun drink, and I think I also forgot to mention the color, but I had written in my notes that it's a mild amber to brass, so thank you for bringing up the color there. Yeah. Uh, for me, the one thing I will say also, it was a fun adventure. It was a fun trip to enjoy it with this. I think the brand name is Balmer's Cake. Uh, we got at King Supers, and it is just that. The milk chocolate frosting covers a... Um, non-sweetened, very moist cake with mousse layers. So the inside is not super sweet. The milk chocolate frosting is, but then the backside of the milk chocolate frosting has all these um, non-sweetened uh, dark chocolate shavings. And the scotch did have a different impact with each one of them. But for me, much like you mentioned, it was a great addition to this particular cake. Um, and I think you're the one who mentioned it. It milds out the scotch a little bit. Not that it's a steep scotch, um, but it did mild it out. It just made it a very mellow drink. Um, but I think what the scotch did for the cake was make out the different chocolate uh, varieties stand out that much more when I was going in between the cake and the scotch and the frosting and the scotch and the dark chocolate and the scotch. And it was a fun experience to have, um, especially with you know such a very and it's not meant to be a criticism but a simple scotch yeah it did really complement the cake there and uh i think another thing i didn't really note in, in my tasting what you brought up though is that there's that little bit of vanilla creaminess in there and so i think that just kind of helped you know bring out those different flavors that mm -hmm. you get in the chocolate cake um yeah i definitely would recommend that and for those of you who are not from colorado instead of king super think kroger so Kroger is the parent company there. That's right. Uh, Vollmer's, I think, still has some of their own bakeries in some areas. That's how they started. And then eventually, man, they made, must have made a killer deal for 22 bucks for this little cake at King Supers. But, it, it, you know, it's worth it. It's time for our shout outs. All right, do you have any shout outs for this week? Oh man, so my first shout out goes to Verstappen, Honda, uh, even though it's not Honda, Red Bull racing team uh, for Verstappen clinching the F1 world title four races before the end of the season here in Japan. Um, awesome job, great drive. Tons of weather between qualifying and the race. Um, it was a nice job. So uh, that's the rule. I, I, second title, two in a row. Cheers. Didn't Sands crash in that? <laughs> yeah, right at the beginning. Or, uh, that was at the beginning? Yeah. Ferrari didn't have as beautiful of his weekend. Leclerc was looking to take second and uh, just had right at the end of the race a, a terrible mishap. Even though it's a little bit more <laughs> homoerotic than I would care for, <laughs> but I do think the uh, new. But he does care for it. I don't. Uh, 
but I think the uh, new interview with the Vampire TV series, uh, it seems uh, it's pretty uh, entertaining. Minus, like I said, some like some spots in that show, but it has like even though like they changed Louis from a white guy to a black guy. Not that I don't really care about that that much. Uh, in fact, I don't care about it at all. I think the guy he does a good job as Louis, and the new and, and the guy who uh, is doing the new Lestat, he's actually doing a pretty good job acting, and uh, it's really kind of a, a, a neat adaptation that they're doing to begin the uh, origin story of Louis. So, if you do get a chance to see it, I, I would recommend it. I'd, so I give that a shout out. Nice. I am actually looking forward to that. I loved, even though I didn't love it the first time I saw it, Queen of the Dam. Oh, that is all such a good of movie. The, the series of movies. Um, that one really clinched it for me. The first time I was though, I was like, oh, well, we. And then a couple years later, I watched it again. I'm like, how did I not love this? Um, all the actors, the selection, the cinematography, really the background, whether it was computer generated or not, was amazing. Yeah, you know, like, I think when I first saw The Queen of the Dam, I was a little bit disappointed in it for two reasons. One, I kind of wish they would have kept uh, Tom Cruise uh, as Lestat. Um, but the guy, like, after, like, many years removed and watching it for the first time in, like, I don't know how long, probably, like, maybe, like, 10 years, um, he actually did a really good job playing Lestat. Uh, and uh, also, the, I think the other thing I didn't really like about it at the time, and since it's pretty far removed since I've seen it again, is I had read uh, Interview with the Vampire, the Vampire Lestat, and the Queen of the Dam books, and they kind of combined the Vampire Lestat book with the Queen of the Dam book, so they kind mm -hmm. of combined two books into one, and so they left out, like, a ton of information. Um, but, like like I said, like so that was, like, the two things that I kind of, like, I didn't like about it when I first saw it compared to now, or I forgot a, about, a lot about both of those books and just seeing, like, the movie again and just with like new set of eyes, like you know, kind of forgetting a lot about the two books. It made it, it made it for a entertaining ride. <laughs> Here's where I'm going to start Biden. I know this is a shocker to everyone. Biden is going to be on my get it together list this week. Right. Um, I think the first one would be uh, Biden not realizing how the color of his carpets as he visited different countries uh, in the Middle East were different colors than the carpets received by Trump. Um, the Trumps to the Middle Eastern cultures considered very royal, regal, respectable. And when Biden showed up, it's like, hey, little kitty, come on up. Like, yeah, come on out of your plane. Let's go talk. And apparently for months, Biden has been trying to convince all of the Middle East because of this uh, uh, OPEC vote that happened last week uh, to not disrupt disrupt the flow of oil they put out. So uh, their exports, uh, as far as how many millions of barrels of oil they will produce each day. And at first, the OPEC countries decided, eh, yeah, so we're thinking about cutting the output by 200,000 barrels. Well, now here's the next thing. You got two main factors, and I'm going to put this in, and I will try to make this quick because I know I talk for hours. I'm sorry, guys. Um, so you got Russia, part of OPEC plus. And then you got Europe trying to control how much they'll pay per barrel of Russia's oil. And they're going to put a cap on how much they'll pay Russia for Russia's oil. Uh, world, please understand this is not how economics work. Otherwise, you would have put a cap on housing decades ago so that there was no such thing as a $5 million house that should only be sold for $300,000 uh, or a $300,000 house that should be 200000 or these ridiculous costs that we have seen come with inflation. But we're going to do that to Russia, right? We're going to allow ourselves to do that to Russia, but not ourselves. So Russia's kind of like, hey, read between the lines. You know what I mean? They're like, hey, yeah, you're missing a zero there, OPEC. OPEC plus votes 2 million, 2 million barrels a day reduced output. And that's what we're getting um, shortly before midterm elections. The one thing that Biden has, and this is almost a shout out, pulled a curtain over so many 
people's eyes with. They're like, oh, consumer confidence is up. 80% of consumer confidence, this is a sad statistic, is based on the price of gasoline at the pump. We have not been paying the taxes that someday we're going to have to pay back. We have not been paying the taxes that is the real price of gas. It's deflated. Biden in the last several months has increased the national debt $1.33 trillion dollars. That's the most like in history. And he's looking to do even more damage. And everyone's just like, yeah, pay off my tuition. Um, yeah, you pay off your tuition. Your taxes go up 10%. You're going to pay four times that. And if you have a long and lasting life to pay off your debt relief, that is not how it works. Just to, um, I think no one, I actually do believe in this, to take some economics classes, really understand supply, demand, and then also expenses, costs. Um, and with those things, understand Watch what happens right after the midterm elections, whether, whether or not there is a, a Democratic sweep or a Republican sweep or a victory in either way, depending on your area, your country, your state. Watch what happens to gas prices come January. Like it's going to be atrocious. And I do appreciate my shout out to Putin and the OPEC plus countries for saying, you're not putting a cap on what we can charge you for gas. It is our product. The United States, by the way, has plenty of fossil fuels. We're just not using them because, uh, oh, I actually have uh, the reason is because here in America, our own companies don't want to pump out gas unless it's going for four fifty to five dollars a gallon at the pump, um, because otherwise they can't make those killer profits that the other countries are making at half that. Well, I'll get rid of uh, regulations. How about get rid of Biden? You could do that too. Um, yeah, if I get it together. It's you know saying biden or anything that like this administration is doing is pretty low-hanging fruit <laughs> and, no, but it's serious so but it's, people it's, are still like but he was better than trump and now people are starting to realize hey man the guy said some he, stupid stuff 20 years ago and the democrats made me think about what he said 20 years ago about people and now i realize what he did for this nation was great and these people, and I, I know where you're going, so I'll stop there. So going along with the uh, low-hanging fruit, um, I'm going to talk about something that you mentioned. All right, let's do this. So I'm going to say I'm going to bring up uh, California and Governor oh Newsom and how they uh, want to uh, basically uh, eliminate pork, I guess, from everyone's diet. Oh, my. Did you look into it a little bit? I, I I just briefly, so I didn't really actually dive deep enough into it. But from my understanding, right, you said there's like, there has to be so many square feet per pig. Yeah, they want to create all sort of sanctions so that any pork that is sold in California, there is proof that all of these, um, I'm going to call them ranchers, can prove that they had X amount of square yardage or footage per animal so right now they're going after pigs um and the, the crazy thing here is even if you had an entire indian sanctuary and it's like 500 acres and you have 500 pigs and each pig has their own anchor. Guess what? They're all going to stay right there, right next to each other. Exactly. They actually prefer that. It's crazy to me. But yeah, so California is trying to do that, which will have an impact, a negative impact on everyone's potential pork prices. And this actually goes in. This uh, this actually goes into a much bigger conspiracy theory about trying to eliminate meat and force people to eat bugs and stuff like that. Uh, just take a look into it, research it, and, uh, you know, so my kind of get together is to the, uh, not only to the California government, uh, but also the, uh, uh, all those uh, people out there that are trying to push this Green New Deal uh, and, uh, or the Great Reset and have us eat bugs and stuff and get rid of meat. JD's Bait Shop. JD's Bait Shop right there by, uh, you know, it's on the north east corner of Clinton and Arapaho. Um, right. Kind of in the smaller corner, not quite as deep as the Home Depot. <laughs> 
<laughs> which is good sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes you got a small cork and you don't want to go deep. Yeah, and I'm not really sure what kind of bait you're trying to pick up there using that bait. <laughs> I know. I'm like, so there's no fishing around here. No fishing. I'm not, maybe uh, maybe they're trying to say you're trying to learn a, a cougar, but I'm not really sure you can find any cougars there. I mean, we did go uh, on a Monday at 4.45. Yeah, but, yeah so. it was like happy hour time, though. There should have been I something. didn't even think about that. I didn't even look for a happy hour menu. I don't yeah. think cougars go for happy hour. They want you to pay full price. They <laughs> want to be so. like, I'm worth it. MasterCard. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not even like, <laughs> I would say like anti-cougar. I'm not sure what's the opposite of cougar. That's probably what you're going to find there in that bait shop. <laughs> fish. Literally, they, you walk in, there's a giant fish tank with a bunch of very simple fish. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, honestly, I... Like, I'm really going to give this place, like, a five, maybe a four. Uh, it was, like, when you first walk in, it's dark. It, it almost has kind of the, uh, um, kind of like the local pub type view, like, look in there. Or, like, uh, what, what, what's, like, the stagecoach? What did I say that was? It's kind of like the, uh, it's like a, well, kind of like local bar, but not like, you know, it's kind of more, like, dark and grungy in there. Like a little hangout? Uh, no, it's kind of, well, no, that's not it. I forget what the actual term is for, like, those kind of bars where they're they're kind of going out of style, though. They're, oh, I know I know which word you're talking about, but it's not coming to the tip of my tongue. Yeah, it's it's totally slipped my mind. But in any case, um, it's really, like, really not all that impressive in there. Uh, so, so, like, honestly, the... Uh, the tavern itself is uh, the or the atmosphere in there was kind of kind of low. There wasn't a whole lot of people in there, especially at the time that we went, which was during happy hour, and um, it just seemed like really low energy, kind of dead. Uh, the food presentation was not that great. Um, really, like it reminded me of going to like a bowling alley and ordering food from the snack bar. Is kind of like what the food reminded me there. Um, but they did have like a decent amount of beers on tap, so that yeah. was kind of decent. Um, they didn't have the particular beer that I wanted, but it's a seasonal beer, so that's understandable. Uh, so, but they did have the other kind that I do like. That's more like the domestic kind, mass produced, which is Michelob Ultra. They had that on tap, so that was kind of good. Um, the waitress was so so. Um, this is another time where the, where a waiter or waitress. Ask, ask me what I wanted to have before I even sat down. And I just find that really bizarre. Like, don't, don't you want to give the person a chance to, like, look at the menu? I'm guessing most people there are regulars and already know what they want before they even come into the restaurant. <laughs> I would assume so. <laughs> uh, so in any case, like, the, I'll give the food, like, I'll give the food maybe, like, a six. It's a good question. Do you always know... What you're looking for when you come before you get into the restaurant? No, I usually don't. Well, if it's a restaurant that I, that I frequent, then yes. It's food for thought. Peaches. But um, in this case, yeah, I never, like, I haven't been to the JD bait shop, so I had no idea what kind of, like, beers they had on tap or anything like or anything like that. Um, but the food I, I thought was a decent value. Um, I got like a, a double hamburger with fries for basically ten bucks, um, which is a decent deal because normally in most places where you, you know you're gonna get like probably pay like eighteen dollars for a burger and fries. So it, like the value was decent, but it's only a plain burger. It's not like you get like Swiss and mushroom or. Uh, Colorado burger or California burger or whatever, you know, like it was just a plain burger. Um, so if you're, if you just want a plain burger, it's okay. Overall though, would I take a date there? No. <laughs> would I meet a friend there to like maybe possibly watch a game or chit chat and catch up? Sure. Why not? I mean, like they had decent beer. Uh, the beer wasn't like $10 a pint, like at some places. So it's still pretty decent on the, uh, on the pocketbook there. But really, it's not a place to impress anybody. Um, now, if you're kind of going for like a, if you're trying to do like a specialty type date where you're just kind of, kind of like low browing it, sure, 
that might be a, a yeah if you're ago. taking your date to the home depot before <laughs> or after like you got sushi <laughs> slash bait shop <laughs> slash home depot like maybe you're having like you know like a like a autumn type of party where it's like uh you know hick like you do like a hickville type of party or something like that or a redneck party, sure. I take a I take a date there, and like on a special occasion like that. And I'm not saying that's a special occasion. I'm, I'm talking like that's kind of like a design party type of thing where, yeah, we're gonna go out to a party and everyone has to dress up as a redneck or something. Okay, well, this is a great place for a redneck to go, probably. I am the one who <laughs> recommended this establishment, by the way, based on one of my previous bosses who I absolutely. Adore uh, Chris Hoff. Hoff, if you ever watch one of these shows, he always went by Hoff. Worked for Target for a very long time. Became my uh, S store team leader at the time. Now store director. If it, the terminology were had had applied in the past, I had mentioned at one point he enjoyed going to this establishment. Maybe it was different back then. Maybe it wasn't. But uh, fond memories made me think of him. Made me think of this establishment. And you know, Hoff, it was interesting. Definitely not my move. Um, you know, look, thinking about your restaurant review, here's where I'm going to go. So here are some of the fun synonyms for a restaurant's bar. Uh, so you got bar, after hours joint, in, ale house, lounge, beer joint, which means something different in a dispensary, uh, saloon, drinkery, tavern, Drinking establishment. None of these are the ones so far, by the way, are anywhere close to the great one that Noah used earlier. Um, bar room, gin mill, roadhouse, <laughs> joint, also different from a distillery, tap room, and my favorite on this list, public house, which is my favorite because I always thought a public house was a restroom. <laughs> <laughs> So with that, <laughs> with that, uh, driving up dive bar, dive bar. That's exactly what it was. I'm dive glad bar. you remembered because Ooh, I think I was struggling there. Yeah. So with that, I think your terminology, your choice of and use of that term is perfect. So uh, one of the things I like to really think about, especially when I think of uh, like, hey, I'm like, if I want to go somewhere, if I want to take someone somewhere, I want to a be impressed. By the way, you got to like self-care, right? We talk about self-care. Take yourself on a damn date once in a while. So I am not taking myself on a date to this place. Uh, I pull up and granted, I drive a small car. My car almost fell into the pothole in my parking space. Did you see that damn thing? It was like a foot deep. My car is like two feet tall. I was like, oh, damn, that's close. So uh, parking lot, not great. Uh, traffic, not great. Uh, really, the traffic pattern for that parking lot, anytime around any sort of rush hour, uh, you will. It's not an easy way out. No, it's not. It's like a trap. It's a trap. <laughs> it's a trap. So with that, um, that's my first piece. I think that's really important to me. When I come up to an establishment, I want to be like, yeah, I want to go in there. I want to enter. So it was half a single guy. Uh, he was engaged at the time. Did he meet her there? Who knows? <laughs> Maybe I should find out. Um, Hoff, this is, you know, please don't take this the wrong way. Um, but, uh, he was married to the woman he was engaged to at that time, later divorced. So maybe yes, maybe no. I don't know if she was bait or if he was bait, by the way. Uh, he did really <laughs> well for him. And he was just a damn good guy. Hoff, you are a damn good guy. I'm sure still, uh, people like that, their greatness with others doesn't change. So I hope you're happy and healthy. I know different things can happen in life. So, um, with that though, uh, the food value. Value for me? This is the one win. Eight. Uh, the jalapeno boppers. An those were good, and I didn't bring those up. That, that was my win. Uh, $8, $7.95, I think it was. You get five full jalapenos stuffed with cheese, wrapped in bacon, breaded, fried, delicious. Uh, that was the win. Uh, the I think they had like 25 beers on tap. That was another win. A great juice drop IPA I enjoyed. And um, I thought the service was great. And then from there, the rest of it is just like, yeah, okay, so the inside was kind of dark and dingy. And, um, the you know, granted, 
their menu, probably true to them, was teeny. To your point, you're not getting any specialty burgers. No. Maybe a great burger. It was a great value if you get a single burger, and you don't want anything special. Great value. Um, overall, to me, though, I'm right there with you. It is a, if you're just going for beer, you're going to go for an eight. If you're going for any sort of food, you're lucky if you get a six. If you're trying to take a date, <coughs> good luck. You might get a five. That's your rating, by the way, not just the bars. Um, the service, again, was great. Um, they had a few entertaining things. The atmosphere, not energetic. So Not at all. No, not at all. And uh, that's one of the things, like, when I think of atmosphere, I'm looking for. I want to be pumped up. I want to, like, find a place I can stay and feel like I want to be as opposed to, all right, let's get the fuck out of here. I think a bunch of Collins go there. From uh, what we do in the shadows. I think you're right. Colin Robinson's absolutely yeah. draining those people who are half dead already. <laughs> like all hitting on the young waitress. And I felt bad for that. Did you see that? Uh, no, because I think the chair that I had was like behind. So everyone yeah. sat behind me. So all I saw was like a stupid like paddle, like tennis looking ping pong game going on. Yeah. So ultimately for me, um, and uh, granted now you guys think about this, our ratings, we've been much more honest lately uh, on a scale of one to 10. This is a five, by the way, though, that's a 50%. Um, that's better than most. This is not your high school grades. This means I'm going there instead of a McDonald's or a Burger King or most other places for a plethora of reason, especially the service. At the end of the day, though, I had their chili cheese, their green chili cheese fries. Um, and as one of my favorite quotes from the, one of the movies we're going to mention here shortly, it was weighed, it was measured, and I was found left wanting. <laughs> yes, very much so. But I think we both can agree with that one. Mm. All right. So uh, I'm going to step back, just trod back one second, because I had one other shout out. Oh, okay. And uh, Mila, if you ever watch this show someday when I'm dead and gone, you're like, oh, I miss dad. Let's go watch some just random episode 84 recorded on October 10th, 2022. Uh, and you're like, ah, oh, he's so the scotch was pretty good. What's the, what the hell is he talking about with peaches? Uh, dad was weird. And then uh, what's not weird is my shout out to you. Just finished your first quarter of free college, great grades. I'm assuming still waiting for all those test scores um, but here's what the point is you have become self-sufficient and the other piece of the shout out goes to starbucks who's paying for this by the way um, and just everything you're doing in life enjoying life being responsible having good friends but also um, really being true to you and that's the first step in what makes any great human in my minds is you might do some stupid things someday uh, but you do it when you're young and you become self-sufficient that is the most important thing because if you're self-sufficient if you can actually live on your own then when you ever do find a partner man you got two self-sufficient people they're living on one self-sufficient income. Hopefully. Yeah, 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 hopefully. You got two self-sufficient people living on one self-sufficient income, and all of a sudden, uh, you are one of those power couples that save up half of what you earn. And not only do you potentially retire early, you're investing, uh, you're creating, you're doing more for yourselves, and most likely the community as well. So, Mila, great shout out. I'm super proud of you. Not always easy uh, finishing high school and trying to figure out what you're you're doing uh when your parents especially won't uh, just give you over you know like 30 grand like a lot of her friends parents did here's 30 grand for your freshman year of college uh no mila sorry so but super proud of you for what you've done to become self-sufficient in that manner Best of Heath Ledger, and if you have any favorite quotes from some of his movies, uh, if you were to think of your top three favorite Heath Ledger movies uh, going from third to first, do you want me to go first or do you want me to go third? Uh, I think we should go three, two, one. <laughs> do you want me to go first or second? Oh, are, are we going to go like third, third, two? So, That's yeah. what I was thinking. Okay, so I'll, I'll go first. Here. All right, man, shoot it. All right, so the paid wad. The Patriots, my number three. Oh, that's a damn good movie. Um, not only because of him, Mel Gibson did a really nice job there, too. Yeah, I think uh, the combination between him and Mel Gibson, um, where he's uh, the, the eldest son, and he's the one who's like really gung-ho for like the uh, American Revolution and the freedom 
and stuff like that and creating a new world. And actually, one of my quotes is from that movie. God damn, look at this man. So, um, should I say the quote yeah, here? Go for or, it. Okay, so the quote here from that movie is um, um, They call this the new world. It's not, it's the same as the old world, but we have the chance to build a new world, a world where all men are are created equal. And I thought that was a good quote because honestly, when you look at our constitution and I'm sure by now, if you watched any of our previous stuff, you know, like probably, I know definitely myself and I could probably say you as well, but I'll let you speak for yourself on that. Um, we do really appreciate the, uh, the founding documents and the constitution and what that means to be a free person. And, and yeah, you know, maybe like the founding fathers, at the time when they like uh, when Jefferson wrote uh, the uh, Declaration and then um, Madison wrote the Constitution, maybe we still had slavery around. But I think what they I think they were thinking beyond the uh, social structure that was already there, and and looking far beyond that to where uh, all men were created equal. And it, it, it does take a little bit of time for that social change to occur. And would it in Slavery would have ended naturally anyways. And one of the things like people don't really understand, like the first person to own a slave in the United States was a black man. So it's kind of like, it's an, it's a dirty, ugly history, uh, but it's our history. And as long as we've learned to grow from it and, and better ourselves as a nation, that's a good thing. And I, and I think when we look at the, the Patriot, I think we can kind of see some of the, the goals there and, some of that desire to want freedom and be free and have each person uh, pursue their own happiness and liberty. Anyways, that's my number three from Heath Ledger. All right. My number three, The Order. Ooh, I like that movie a lot. Um, and the reason the number three, and we talked briefly about this, uh, my number three is The Order, is because it does leave me questioning the potential, the origin of a sin eater, if you will, um, something that's in between. And I love the thought of the in between. So you have the gods and the mortal, those that live forever, those that die. What if there is something in between that can do both, but also has limited powers? Um, and I think that's what I enjoyed the most. I, did, I think that was like his best acting. No, I think he had other movies that have better acting that just didn't enthrall me as much. Uh, his uh, co-star, super hot in there also, definitely... Do you played, know her name? I don't. I don't. Oh, but she's hot, though. She, well, she was. I don't know what she looks like now. She was in a couple movies with him, um, 40 Days and 40 Nights with, uh, you know, she was in a, a, a myriad of movies. Right. Uh, attractive in all of them. But I, I think what was attractive about her in each one of these movies was her playful innocence, which I'm sure at some point was just lost. I'm sure. Uh, but so for me, um, the order and, uh, I, I wrote down two quotes that are my favorite two from all Heath Ledger movies and neither of them were from the order, although it did have some pretty good runs. It did have some pretty good ones. And, um, it was a very interesting, uh, uh, movie, you know, based on like him being a Catholic priest and, uh, and the uh, ways to get into heaven. So it was a, I like it. It's one of my favorites, but it didn't make my top three though. All right. How about you for number two? Number two, Dark Knight. Ooh. Because see here, I think you made a, a good point in this, uh, what you said about the order, um, that he had better like, um, movies where he had done bit, where he did a better job acting. And then, but that's different than what my favorite movie is. So my favorite movie by him is different than when the movie I thought he did the best job in as an actor. The, the movie I thought he did the best job as an actor is The Dark Knight. I think how he played the Joker was incredible. I loved it. It's a great movie, but I, I really think him and how he uh, dedicates himself to acting. Um, method every, acting. Method acting. I think he just got so deeply involved with with being the Joker that he made a great Joker. And I remember originally when I saw him, 
like the leaked pictures of him in that move, you know, for the Joker. I was like, oh, I'm not sure Heath Ledger is going to do a, a good job as the Joker and stuff like that. Because I think the only thing we had really compared to at that time, really movie wise, uh, was the original Batman movies with uh, Michael Keaton and Jack Nicholson. And Jack Nicholson did a pretty good job as a comic book type of Joker. Wes but, Craven didn't do him justice. No. But uh, I think Tim that Burton. Was, yeah, Tim Burton. Sorry, not with Scraven. <laughs> um, but I think uh, the uh, job that he did in Dark Knight was incredible. And um, I didn't have the quote there because I didn't really find the quote for it. Um, but there's definitely two quotes from uh, Dark Knight that I, I kind of liked. One of them, one of them was um, how he was talking about society and like how basically people are kind of bad, basically. And I, and that's like when the two boats are out there, and I don't I didn't find that exact quote, so I can't really quote that part. But the other one I found was, do I really do I really look like a guy with a plan? You know what I am? I'm a dog chasing cars. I wouldn't know what to do with one if I caught it. I just I just uh, I just do things, and I think uh, I think that's such a great quote from him because the Joker. I think he actually does have plans. But he's just so like way out there, cuckoo smart that he like it kind of comes off as he has no plans. I think that that's an interesting piece, and um, yeah, my my favorite quote, my and it would be number three in my quotes list of Heath Ledger is simply when he asks, "Why so?" Serious. Oh yeah, that's a great. That's a that's a very quotable one. And why I think that that one is dynamic to me is because the way he says it, it was a brilliant piece of acting at that moment, and the the full scope of that scene, he means it. He's like, "Why are you so serious? Like, why are you?" So, and I think about that sometimes. Where. Um, we've all been in these situations, at least I have. Uh, I, I guess I shouldn't speak for everyone, but we've been in these situations most likely where someone else, you say something little and you're joking and they lose their shit. Like it <laughs> falls everywhere, right? And it's just like... I've only been in that occasion once or twice myself. Yeah, yeah I know, <laughs> right? It happens all the damn time. Like I, I inappropriately joke a lot, by the way. Uh, so with that though, people like sometimes if they're in the wrong mindset is really the truth um typically when people take it the wrong way when i say it um, but they lose their shit like it's just dropping out like they're goats and you're at yoga and it's just like pebbles and skittles ah, it's just everywhere um but the way he said that i think about that all the time and sometimes when i'm having a great day at work and somebody else is losing it i'm like thinking that that's literally what i think is his face saying why so serious and that's a good, that is a great quote there. It's so simple, but it's genuine. And it can be really, I think most people can relate, even though they, be the way he says it and the fact that he says it and the point in the movie when he says it, when you realize this guy is evil, there, and it's not that he even intends to be evil, subconsciously, as you mentioned, he is evil. Uh, nobody wants to relate to that because it's he's just like literally laughing inside, but asking somebody else, why are you being a fool? You know, here's a kind of an inter interesting thought here. You know, a Batman dresses dark, but he's really light. And? And the Joker, he dresses like a, like a bright beacon, like with the white face and like the purple suits and stuff like that, but he's really dark. Yeah. It's kind of a, a weird... It's camouflage. Yeah. It's natural. It's what animals and do. They are, and they are the exact... They they are the yin to each other's yangs. Yeah. And I think that's a beautiful part of that movie. And they do it well. It's just that. Is between the two of them, nobody else. Bane does a close second, even though he's not really the criminal on his show. Um, nobody in almost any movie will ever be as great a an adversary adversary as Heath Ledger's Joker to Christian Bale's Batman. And I think that was part of a, a reasonable 
step away of Christian Bale and Chris Nolan from the Batman franchise when they did. There's lots of other things, the shooting at the cinema and other things, um, which can be justified as well. But I think if nothing else, man, there's a point when you, you may not want to admit it, but you realize you've peaked and it's time to move on to something else because that was so great. Um, that duo but to me man that's not a movie i can watch every day because it's not lighthearted. it's so it's so intense it is super intense i do love it but at the end of that movie in particular my heart is broken and because of that it's not one of my favorite movies i can see that (laughs) what's your number two all right my number two 10 things i hate about you that is a fun movie and i I watched this for for the first time (laughs) earlier today um so many things I, I love about this movie is that it, it's something I want to watch again because it is a love story. It's also a young love story. And tragically, most loves evolve beyond young love. And sometimes that's necessary. Kids, other things, if the young love wasn't mature enough to be mature love. <coughs> um, some things have to change, but what a great story about reality and i can relate i remember being a teenager (coughs) just a couple years ago right (laughs) right (laughs) so it's not hard to remember um i remember those things and one of the hardest things in life is just to like put it out there and be honest and until you are 100 percent comfortable with yourself you are inclined to hide the truth this movie shows that but there's another side of when you're super uncomfortable with life you always put a truth not necessarily the truth a truth your version of the truth out there and julia styles character does that brilliantly um man this pair is another fun pair where they dance it kind of reminds me uh, of shakespeare in a way um just this dance between a couple where they want friction but they want love they know there's a natural attraction but they question whether or not it could ever work and at the end of the day uh it's a great story heath ledger becomes a great mentor to a younger student and lets him know and it's actually part of one of the great great quotes not one of my two favorites um but he's like don't let anyone else decide what's right for you like if she's worth it she's worth it you've got to decide that don't let anyone else decide that for you um it is it's 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 miraculous um the way that that is portrayed because it's the part of the movie i remember most is him literally grasping this young man two years is younger by the shoulder and telling him don't let anyone else decide what's right for you you decide what's right for you meanwhile he's struggling within himself so it's kind of funny that you uh, are mentioning this uh this movie because he Ledger played the joker mm-hmm. and then the younger person he's mentoring the younger student is actually in batman Man. robin uh no not robin he um he actually plays that uh, in the movie with bane oh and catwoman he's the police officer that was also an orphan that actually inherits the Batman stuff. Right, but isn't he who becomes Robin? That's what I mean. Theoretically, Theoretic, possibly. Like, I, think that's, yeah. I think that's like the yeah. Nolan's version of like who Robin's going to be. Cheers. Or I probably would say probably maybe not maybe not Robin, since Batman and Robin work together. Probably more like Nightwing. Okay. I got you. I got you. But yes, yes, yes. I do remember that. But in any case, I actually had that down as one of the quotes there. All right. You got is, it right uh, then. Let's say it. Don't let anyone ever make you feel like you don't deserve what you want. Go for it. And I thought that was like actually a really great quote. I think that 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 pertains to so much in life. You shouldn't let anyone dictate to you what you can or cannot do, what you what you deserve or what you don't deserve. That's all left up to you. And so if you believe that you deserve something, if you believe that you are worth something, then you should go after what you want. I think that's solid. Yeah. It is a weird As the kids say, that's 100. Or that slaps. That slaps, yeah. I think that's 100 is actually before, like, the actual kids nowadays. So I think that's, like, more millennial. Yeah. Yeah. That's all right. Um, I think another interesting thing about that quote when I think about that. Ah, man, it's just a hard fact. 
always try to impress others, just impress yourself. So yeah. it's, it is a great quote. That movie though, like kind of makes that movie, um, which also makes for my number one movie too, is the soundtrack. The soundtrack was awesome in that movie, uh, 10 Things I Hate About You. Uh, like they had so, so many like great songs from that era. Funny that you say that. Cause when I was watching it with my son, I literally Shazam six different tracks to get the exact songs from it. <laughs> <laughs> but aren't they great songs? They are. They're like, fun I want songs. you to want me. And it's yeah. truth. Like, especially yeah. as a teenager, that's what you want as an adult, by the way, husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, uh, whatever. By the way, not necessarily sensually, but parent-child, you want to be wanted as a parent or as a child, you uh, as a boyfriend, girlfriend. You want to be wanted as a boyfriend, girlfriend. Well, I think that's the bottom line. Anybody wants to be wanted. If you're not wanted, then why are you going to hang around? That's just it. And that, I don't think most people, I think most, let me turn that around. I think most people undervalue what it means to make sure others know you want them if you do, and then also their own need to be wanted. And it's a different thing. Like there is a truth. Some people need to be needed. A lot of times moms uh, lose their shit when they don't feel needed anymore. And for me, I'm like, I don't give a shit so much about the need. It's about want. Um, I will always be there for my responsibilities when I need them. That is the truth. But when I'm wanted, man, I put in the OT for free. So uh, this actually brings up uh, something like totally off topic. <laughs> But not like too far we never topic. do that. The tangent. <laughs> so tangent alert here. But I went to go see the movie Amsterdam this weekend. Oh, shit. And uh, there is a great, a, a really great quote oh. where it's mentioned to one of the characters when it comes to love. Do you need the person or do you choose the person? Because if you choose the person, then that's more leaning towards love. Whereas if you need the person... That's not love. I agree with that. And I think, uh, you know, to what you were just saying right there, just only reminded me of that quote because, you know, if you don't, if people don't value you or, or they like only hang on to you because they have a need, that's not love. And that, and you really shouldn't be around those, those type of people like that. Anyways, it, it should be like you choose them and they choose you, whether it be friends, whether it be, uh, uh, your partner in life, whatever. But, you know, it should be like you should be chosen and you should choose who you want to be around and and, and make sure you, you're choosing the right people to be around. Yeah, 100 percent agree. One hundred. <laughs> one hundred. <laughs> so uh, the one slippery slope I think about when I think about that is when you need to be wanted and that person gives you that desire. But right that, there you have that need, though. You know. That's the thing, though. If you know that they give that to you and that that's not going away and that's still something you need, like you're just being honest with yourself there. I think that's where there's this, like you have to be honest with yourself psychologically to beat some of the curves with these mind games, with the difference between want and need. Um, because I think there are times where, whether it's an introvert or an extrovert, you all need something. And somebody else may feel, may feel that void, but then when you want that, that um, that amplified interaction is when it becomes more important. And the honest truth is, you may always know you still need that, but you want it from them. Now, I think that's a great quote. I still have not seen Amsterdam, but um, you're one of a couple of people that I've heard say it was great um so i'm sure dude it's probably up there for oscars and stuff you got margie uh margot robbie margot robbie uh christian bale always it's a good movie um so but to stay on point here i guess and we we're talking about soundtracks before we went on that little sidetrack there you're going in your movie number one my my favorite all-time heath ledger movie is a night's tale dude we're right there we don't I, i'm just i'm not even gonna wait to come back around to me i'm right there with you it is my favorite as it is well such, 100 it's such a <laughs> fun 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 <laughs> and the soundtrack low rider uh oh so, so he's like a, like a, the boys are back in town you got some like these oldies like uh rock music and i was watching like when i used to own the when i used to have a dvd player or a blu-ray player uh and had the special editions on there 
like the guy who like created this movie actually designed the movie around the soundtrack first and he did he did a great job at picking the soundtrack and then building the movie around it and there's just a lot of fun things in there there's a part like when he wins his like first like sword match and then the guy like uh, he will he will rock you <laughs> but uh, like when he wins his first like sword match um the Chaucer, the guy who plays Chaucer, uh, he does like big huge speech and like no one cheers. And then one of his like uh, st- uh, stewards or whatever goes, yeah. And then all the <laughs> crowd cheers. And while they filmed it in Czech Republic, and a lot of the people that were extras didn't speak English, so they had no idea what he said. Oh God, so they so didn't know. Perfect. So they didn't know that's that they're so supposed perfect. to cheer. But we watched the movie. <laughs> and you see it. It's so cheesy and funny that the that they kept it in there, and it just kind of rolls with the whole movie and. Uh, the movie, like, I, I like I used to actually, like, when I had the DVD player, I'd almost play that movie every night and fall asleep to it because I just <laughs> love the soundtrack. And um, mm. it was, uh, yeah, I, I really, really enjoy it. And, like, one of the best quotes, and, uh, and you've already mentioned the quote there uh, about, like, uh, the uh, I found you wanting, right? Yeah. I weighed, measured, and found you wanting. It's you have actually, been weighed, you've been measured, and you have but been it's, found. It's wanting. actually not like Heath Ledger who says that. It's the other. It's the other mm-hmm. guy. Actually, Heath Ledger does say it. At Adamar. The very, very, yeah, Adamar. But Ledger does say it at the very, very end. Um, but it's just like uh, one of the main things of why I really love that movie is about changing your stars. He talks about like mm-hmm. you can change your stars, and there's actually a quote in there which I didn't pull up the quote. I didn't look it up. Oh, there's so many good quotes. Yeah. I, but one of my favorite quotes in there is, how did the nobles become noble in the first place? They took it. And when you really think about it, they did. They Like, the nobles did take it. And um, I, I do believe, like, the message there is almost kind of like the, uh, the American dream, right? If you want something bad enough and you work hard enough for it, there's a chance that you'll be able to get it. I mean, that's part of, like, freedom and liberty and stuff like that, is that if you put in the work and you try for it, and you take that risk, you know, with big risk comes big rewards. And, or uh, death. <laughs> or death. <laughs> but, I mean, I think that's, I think, I think the message is there, right? I mean, like, they had, he had the chance, like, they could, uh, they could have kept on being poor, but they, they stepped out on, uh, on the ledge, right? And they took the risk of one of them to become a knight and go through all the tournaments and they made wealth and they built their own, like, little, you know, set group. And I just think it's a it's a really cool story. I think it kind of helps inspires people to really like if they have a goal or a dream to pursue that um, you can actually watch that movie for inspiration, really, because I think there's a lot of things you can pick up out of it. Um, I think that you nailed one of the pinnacle pieces why that is my my most favorite Heath Ledger movie. And that is because, and there's actually a quote, it's not one of, it's not the other quote I wrote down here, um, but his affair lady talks about hope. And without hope, there's no purpose. Um, and I agree with you. This is one of these movies. And here's something that's going to be twisted. Um, slight tangent. Um, one of the other movies that gave me hope when I was a teenager and my mom spent $80. Mom, when you ever watch this, if you ever watch this, thank you so much for spending $80 for my birthday present to buy me on VHS, $80, Bloodsport. <laughs> Um, because that was another movie that gave me hope. Um, someone who followed through with their dreams and w- risked a lot, if not everything, um, but was good to their people. Uh, my favorite scene in this movie does not correlate with my favorite quote. Uh, my favorite scene in this movie is actually right near the end when he has been found by his adversary, Adamar, um, that he... And cheap side with his dad. Yeah, was at cheap side with his dad. And um, Adamar has him imprisoned and um, said to be publicly defaced, probably killed. Like when they stoned him, most times they killed him. So he's, you know, sitting there and... Uh, before he's put to that spot, he has a chance to run, and his whole team 
uh, his blacksmith. Oh, that's a good part. Yeah, this is a good oh, scene. Oh, man. Like every one Emotional. of his entourage is, he's asking them one at a time, what, what should I do? What should I do? What should I do? And they're all like, and you can see them all get emotional you should go run and it's not that any of them want him to run but none of them want him to perish because he's a good guy and um man even for me it's like at the very end after every one of them and chaucer's the one man that clinches it like he's the one that brings the tears to my eyes he's just like run run and he's like no i won't and he goes and he gets imprisoned. He gets put. What do they call those things? It's like stock, stock, uh, the stocks, stocks, the stocks. Yeah. yeah, gets put in the stock, and the public start throwing typically tomatoes, oh, fruits, vegetables. Yeah. If you haven't been to a rotten, Renaissance festival, yeah. <laughs> the rotten veggies and stuff. Um, and later on, by the way, in real history, it turned to rocks and stuff that would kill these people. Uh, but this same crew defended him. Defended him. And what makes the, the piece the greatest is this is when the prince steps up. And there's other pieces of the movie. You have to watch the whole thing. Don't want to uh, go to the whole history. But at one point, he does this same prince justice at the beginning of the movie. Nobody else would do this prince. He does this prince a, a, an odd justice, by the way. And the prince steps up out of the crowd and mentions... A couple of things you had a chance to run and you did not. That is night worthy. Um, and also talks about the loyalty of his people. Tom. The loyalty of your people is just, un it's unbelievable. It's also worthy of a knight. So he has him removed from the stocks, turns him into a knight, and makes a comment to your point. This is where it gets beautiful. I have personally seen this man's documents <laughs> so many generations beyond six of history. And if anyone dare question me <laughs> about what have I have seen as the prince, step forward. No one will question the damn prince. He literally is the one who not so much took it for hate. You know, Heath Ledger's character, but gave it to him, at which point Heath Ledger does take it, gets his chance. Um, beautiful movie, changes his stars. Uh, but you know, here's uh, the thing about the scene that you're talking about, really. Um, when the, his whole team is telling him to run and he's saying not that he's not going to run, that right there really tells you a difference between a follower versus a leader. And you can see with him being a leader, he's taking the risk. He's like, I led you guys this far. He literally says something like that. Yeah. And, you know, I led you guys this far. Um, I'm not going to back down now. Um, I'm taking the risk. I'm going to continue with the risk and, and we're going to, and we're going to move forward. And you know, that's, that's all about being a great leader. You know, like they all like you're the, if, when you're a great leader, the people that you're leading, don't want to see you fail and they don't want to see you get hurt and they'll, and they'll come to your defense. But at the same time, you can't hide behind your people either. You right. gotta, you gotta lead them. And I think this is such a great moment that actually shows you some true qualities of what a true leader should be like. Sorry. I didn't mean to really like take away no, from here. I'm actually making a note. Um, that I'm going to use at work. I, I think that's absolutely brilliant. So my quote, my final quote, and it's this is the cheesy side of it uh, because it's a love story, right? It's a romance. <laughs> uh, it's one of the reasons this movie is fun is because it, whether or not you're married or you're single, uh, you've been married, you've been divorced, you love a man or you love a woman, you love an it, a sheep, a llama, a goat, who knows what. Uh, if you love something, though, you feel this desire to make them feel wanted. Right. I'm wanted. So uh, it, my favorite quote is, and uh, this is him telling it to his fair lady in a note. He has a note written because <laughs> he can't write, by the way. And it is, I miss you like the sun misses the flower. Like the sun misses the flower in the dead of winter. Instead of heavy to 
dry its light to the heart hardens like the frozen world you uh, your absence has banished me to so great quote and I'm, are you going to read more to it? or is No, that, that's, like, that's really but the... But here's, here's another great part about this, right? Like, as you were talking about in your previous scene, we're talking about leadership. His whole team comes <laughs> together and helps him write, write this poem. Like, you know, uh, the uh, forger lady, she, like, throws in a part there. Uh, the two, like, crazy guys, you know, that he's been with the longest, they throw in some bits and pieces in there. And Chaucer, who's a, a, a writer, he throws in his bits and parts. Uh, but as a team, because they don't want to see him to fail and they want him to get the woman that he wants and all that stuff, they the team comes together for him. And once again, it just shows you what kind of leader he, he is and the loyalty that he's built among those who follow him. Yeah, no, I 100% agree. Uh, but for me, particularly people um, who are educated, so probably not a 12-year-old, uh, part- <laughs> people who are educated or are are well read. Uh, I know you read a lot. People who are well read, and especially in different literatures, Chaucer. Uh, let's face it. Mm, was there a famous author, Chaucer? Yes. <laughs> so, so some of these different pieces. When you take these pieces, Shakespeare and everything else, and you roll them into this, it is this beautiful piece of. Uh, that is a Shakespearean sonnet. <laughs> <laughs> it is super romantic, but also something that is, unless you've truly been in love, you can't understand that. What is it like when you are trying to show your all? You're the sun. You are, like, if you really think about this, you're trying to show your all. You're trying to be the sun. You're trying to be the show off. Could be the quarterback for the football team. Could be the the head cheerleader could be any number of things you're trying to show off everything and the other one the one you're trying to show off everything to is there and they're enjoying it and they're enjoying it because you're having this impact on them now so in this case it's the sun on the flower the flower there for photosynthesis if you haven't gotten to biology (laughs) i can't help you there it is basic science it's freshman science usually middle school science by the way but it is basic science um the flower thrives with that and so does in retrospect theoretically emotionally the sun the sun therefore did something good um the sun was rewarded by getting an impact on something it wanted to um and then when that's gone man it is like the dead of goddamn winter it is like where are all the flowers i live that here all winter long uh my front yard and backyard are beautiful with flowers right now still october 10th even my daughter yesterday was like man your flowers look amazing thank you so much Mila, uh, by the way, and and it's one of those things where, man, a couple months from now when they're all dead, I'm in the dead of the winter, I want to be out there watering them because even our our neighbors and friends and uh, people throughout the neighborhood, people who just walk the trail near the house, they have commented all year long, I love your flowers, oh, your flowers are so pretty, and at the beginning of the season, I really admire what you do every year with your flowers because as they take their walks, as I take my walks, by the way, is that an age thing? You get over 18 and all of a sudden you start taking walks. Damn, 21 came fast. But with that, you're taking your walks and you do want to see beauty. And it's one of those things where uh, this is so impactful to me because when I'm in a relationship, and I think this is part of why we talk about, you know, even tonight's restaurant, the bait shop. Are you taking a date there? No, that's not a date place for most people because you're not giving them your son. You're not giving them your best. You're not giving them anything they need unless all they want is a beer and a shitty dive bar. And if that is it, and there are that is a place for some people, you're a 10 out of 10 there. I go there every night. For me, that's not my place. I want a little bit fancier. Um, yeah. So you, you brought up a, poor, a point about Chau, uh, Chaucer, right? He, uh, there is actually a time in history where he actually disappears for like 12 years or something. And in the, uh, in the, uh, the extras, they talk about that. And that's actually like this time frame that he's with Yeah, that the night's pale tale is supposed to take place. Yes. Yeah, that's about, that's, that's about his missing 12 years and stuff. That's, that's how that he comes to be a part of that group. I love it. 
So yeah, that was like that. That was kind of documented in that ex- in the extras. And what's great, by the way, and you know, I like a movie. I'm watching the extras. Oh man, no shit. But beyond that, uh, most artists, whether it's literature or visual art or photography, they all have a time of their life where they disappear. Yeah. And, and to me, that's something that's interesting about that is I think that's when they actually find themselves. And they also find out, hey, yeah, I'm going to be someone who wants to be in a relationship or not in a relationship or this, that, or the other. <coughs> um, At least all he had to do is trudge around nude for a while because he lost all of his clothes betting. <coughs> but that just, he loved gambling so damn much, right? <laughs> uh, visit the history pages on Chaucer and gambling. Might be <laughs> interesting. So that's uh, yeah, those, that was my final quote. Uh, just because I think for me, um, that's, that's my dream letter to be written, um, and to be received, uh, is to make someone know that, Hey man, this is you to me. And, uh, when I receive the letter in response, it's dynamite. All right. Um, I'm not sure there's like a much cut worthiness here to go on to the cutting floor. So <coughs> We'll go ahead and wrap it up here. Anything you want to finish up with on uh, on Heath Ledger? No, um, I, I think for me the reason that because Batman: The Dark Knight was one of my favorite movies, uh, top twenty five. Uh, I think one of the reasons, and this is unfair because it probably should be in my top three, but uh, it should absolutely be higher than the order. But the reason it wasn't is because when I think of Heath Ledger and The Dark Knight, I also think of his tragic demise way too early in life because the guy was a phenomenal actor. And in one of his uh, interviews that I saw on TV, um, whether it was live or not, who knows? With TV, you never know. There's always at least a 12-second delay, right? Uh, with that, though, he mentioned that he had never had an actual acting class. That he oh, was seen by he was seen by a group of producers and just plucked and put into this position because they immediately believed he would succeed. He did. Um. And with that, though, I think that's where the method acting came into role. But I think that's why also he is such a dynamic actor to me is I don't think there was any acting. I think that was really him. He was living his life. He was being honest. He was being genuine. Um, If you're method acting, you're putting yourself through extremes, possibly doing drugs to act like a drug user. Uh, He's had movies. Well, isn't Bill kind of a method actor, too? Yes. And that, that's why that's why they that's why they're a dynamic. That uh, yeah. Um, Sorry, I didn't mean to like no, de- de- I, derail you there. No, you didn't derail me because that is the tragedy. Here is I think that's another piece of why they worked so well together. You see that with Christian Bale and the Machinist more than anything. Early Christian Bale, uh, you'll probably actually have to hunt for that one at this moment um, because the guy lost. So, I think he was ninety eight pounds when he did that movie. Um, with method acting, it's not necessarily healthy, uh, but for many people it works and many actors try it and most can't do it by the way uh but heath ledger and christian bale did and um i i just really when i think of batman the dark knight i think that this movie is one of those things that brought him to his uh po- potential demise well his actual demise uh but ten- but this movie potentially brought him to that and just when i think of heath ledger it makes me sad because his potential was limitless uh, where he could be now. We're talking Clint Eastwood and beyond, most likely, especially for someone who had never taken acting classes, uh, much like Clint Eastwood and his spaghetti westerns in Italy. Uh, you don't have to take acting classes when you're not acting. You're just being yourself and being a badass. Uh, and that's what Heath Ledger was, a sexy badass. Um, so, uh, you know, Heath Ledger, to you and... Uh, your family cheers uh, a death way too soon, but thank you for everything you gifted us. Yeah, I'll just keep mine really short and simple here. Uh, he had a great career. Too bad it ended too early. And like you said, thank you for all the great uh, material that you put out there for us to enjoy. Um, I will say that our, our next topic for next week is going to be, we're going to take a step back into our conspiracy theory world. I need another drink. <laughs> And we're going to uh, look into MK Ultra, different methods that that have been used or tried. Uh, does it actually really work or not? And I believe we will have a special guest for that one. And the uh, scotch that we will be that we will be trying that evening is going to be the Belvini Twelve. All right. 
which I didn't pick up a new one, but we do have one up here on the shelf anyways. Uh, yeah, so the Balvini 12. Ooh, this uh, looks like a decadent beast. We'll find out next week on Scotch Hour episode 85. And also, if you do want to like uh, become a patron member, it's the very first thing down below. Thank you for our, everyone who listens to us on uh, any of our different uh venues for audio listening and thank you for those who do watch us on youtube and rumble we'll probably start promoting more rumble than we are youtube since youtube decided that they wanted to shut down one of our episodes so we'll try to build up our rumble uh um presence a little bit more i think and uh with that thank you all everyone hopefully you have a great night and i'll pass it on to you uh remember life is Great. And I mean that in the sense of life, living. Um, it's not always easy, but it is great. There are hard times, there are tough times, and there are also easy times and great times. Celebrate the great, uh, figure out what you want. Life is great. Drink responsibly. Do not drink and drive. And uh, man, like, share, subscribe. Give us that feedback. We will use it. We always have. Uh, and until next time. Na 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 Scotchman! Cheers. Cheers. We hope you enjoyed this evening's episode of Scotch Hour. If you did, please like, share, and subscribe. Also, if you have not done so already, please become a patron member with memberships starting as low as $1 a month. Thank you, and hopefully you have a wonderful evening.